Sounds like a long way to go to me. <laughs> Silly me. <laughs> it's got a wonky wheel. I can't be lost walking around a building, surely. Hello and welcome back to my channel and my final day of my three day trip to London. Three days go so fast when you're having fun. But the weather's held out, which is brilliant. If you're not subscribed to my channel, then please do subscribe. Over 90% of the people who watch my channel are not subscribed. So if that's you, just hit that subscribe button, the bottom right hand corner of your screen and support my channel. So what's in the, what's the plan for today? Well, a cup of tea and some breakfast, I think first. And then I'm going to make my way up in towards, I think, Covent Garden and then head east towards the city. I do have an appointment at half past two. It's a very nice attraction. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that as the video goes along. But let's head up towards Hyde Park where I was yesterday at that delightful little cafe and find a nice cup of tea a tasty sausage roll. I do like a tasty sausage roll. I've come back into Hyde Park. I was here yesterday for breakfast. Enjoyed my sausage roll and a cup of tea. And today, well, I've got the same. <laughs> I do like a cup of tea and a sausage roll. Oh, a cup of tea, just the best start to any day. I think I said that yesterday. I was right, I had a good day yesterday. Hope you enjoyed that video because you're in for a treat today. Especially my appointment at half past two. Tell you more about that later. I'm sitting here in front of this delightful little fountain. It really is rather, rather pleasant here. You hear the birds singing in the trees. And there's no noise here either. I had a leaf blower yesterday or a chainsaw or something. I think it was a chainsaw because there's, the trees opposite have recently been cut down at the top and thinned out. So I guess that's what they were doing. They were over in this direction yesterday. It's really rather nice here. So what is the plan for today? Well, I'm really not too sure. I'm gonna take the underground to Covent Garden, as I've already said, and then make my way up through to St. Paul's, see what we can discover around there, and then head to my appointment at half past two. And then later on in the afternoon, I have to catch my coach from Victoria back home again. I came down on the coach, National Express coach, um, it was brilliant. I'm gonna travel back with them as well because it's free and I get staff discounts, which is brilliant. So uh, I'm just gonna finish my cup of tea. Oh, that's lovely. And then go to find the underground. got off the underground at uh, Covent Garden. The station was opened on the 11th of April uh, 1907 and there are 193 steps all the way up from the platforms to the top. Took the elevator, thought it'd be easier. Got a lot of walking to do today so I didn't want to tire myself out needlessly walking up the steps. I usually do though. Burns off the calories but there's a pub behind me called the, uh, the Nags Head. And it's been there since 1670. One of the oldest pubs in the, uh, in the Covent Garden area. But it's quite pleasant walking down towards, towards the market here, the old Covent Garden market. But it's still a market because there's lots of shops and cafes and restaurants. But it's not as busy as it is, not busy now, compared to how, how busy it will be 
around lunchtime when everybody comes here for their um, their lunch. It was busy yesterday at Spitalfields Market. So you can imagine just how um, how busy it gets here in Covent Garden. Walked around Covent Garden in one of my last videos from London. I had quite a disappointing day that day. Uh, it's back during all the all the COVID stuff was uh, was 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 popular in London. I say popular. It was still, still restrictions, I should say. And everything was sort of closed, and it was just wasn't wasn't particularly brilliant. Uh, wandering around, I still had a good time walking around here, but couldn't really do what I wanted to do because of the COVID regulations. So, uh, but it's quite uh, it's quite pleasant. There's always the delivery vans everywhere at the moment. I guess when it's quiet here, they come in. So I'm going to get out of the way before I get run over. No sooner has I said those words than uh, the lorry decides to reverse towards me from behind. But there we go. Just crossed off, um, cross over uh, Bow Street. Famous, of course, it's Bow Street Runners. Founded in 1749 by uh, a magistrate, Henry Fielding. There's only six of them. We used to run everywhere, hence the name, the Bow Street Runners. Uh, the police force was um, disbanded in 1839, yes, 1839, and incorporated into the uh, Metropolitan Police, which was also newly formed and more, as well, more established, I should say. I don't know too much about the uh, history of London Police. Maybe I should investigate that a little further. But this street is Catherine Street, and I'm just walking past the entrance to the famous Drury Lane Theatre. I've seen many productions there over the years, and it really is just an incredible experience going to this theatre. It's quite vast inside, and they can really put on the, uh, the really lavish productions. And uh, it's, it's, I think it was 42nd Street was the, the last play that I saw there, musical. Yeah. It's going back quite a few years. I haven't been to the theatre in London for uh, for quite a few years. But the theatre is said to be haunted as well by a former actor, I think. Don't research ghost stories because I don't really believe in them. But um, if you happen to know the answer to that question, who haunts the Drury Lane Theatre? and leave a comment in the comment section below. And have you seen him? Yeah, I don't believe in ghosts. Maybe if I had a, an encounter with an apparition, I might just change my mind, but I'm very skeptical, very open on these things. I'm sure there is something in it. I'm sure ghosts do exist, but I'll keep an open mind. When I come down to the Aldwych, Oh, digging the place up. Why is it when I go away on a holiday, they always dig the place up? Very difficult trying to film with the noise of mechanical diggers. Builders talking bollocks. Oh, I don't know. Ooh. Back on the wall to Ivan Novello. 1893 to 1951. Composer and actor manager. Lived and died in a flat on the top floor of this building. Ooh, why never never hello? There we go. I do like looking at blue plaques. I tend to find quite a few of my trips around London. So you do learn so much from reading blue plaques. The history of a local area. People who once made the town or the city or that area what it is. But uh Oh, there's the Waldorf Hotel on my, uh, on my left. <laughs> Made famous, of course, the, the Waldorf Salad. Apple, celery, mayonnaise, grapes. I can't remember the words from for that, that classic episode of Faulty Towers. Uh, with the Waldorf Salad, but... 
invented in the Waldorf Hotel, I think, in New York. Yeah, little interesting facts about the places I walk past. But let's, uh, let's head further down the Aldwych and see what we can discover as we make our way towards my half past two appointment. The building on my right is St Clement Danes Church. It's actually the RAF's church. It's where they hold all their services and memorials. And just behind is the statue of the great Dr Johnson, Dr Samuel Johnson. He's of course famous for writing the dictionary, first English dictionary. I think his statue was unveiled there back in 1907. His house is somewhere down here, so that's we'll try and find that in a moment. But the interesting building is number 216, the Strand. I'm just coming onto the Strand from, from the Aldwych. Number 216 is the home of Twining's Tea, founded in 1706 by Thomas Twining. And they've occupied that site ever since. And on my left, of course, is the Royal Courts of Justice. A fantastic building designed in the Victorian Gothic style back in the 1870s. It was opened by Queen Victoria back in 1882. And of course, Fleet Street is famous for the newspapers. It's where all the newspapers used to be in Fleet Street. Uh, they've all moved out to uh, smarter offices elsewhere now. So newspaper printing is no longer done in Fleet Street. I don't think there are any um, newspapers or magazines based in Fleet Street. This is where it all used to happen. But somewhere down here, as I say, is Dr. Johnson's house. So let's try and see if we can find that. I haven't been there before, so I'm not quite sure where it is. I did ask a friend the other week, and he said, uh, look for a pub called the Tipperary. Sounds like a long way to go to me. <laughs> okay, bad joke. Okay, long way to Tipperary, the old song. But I think it's down here somewhere, so let's try and find the Tipperary. And then Dr. Johnson's house. Just walked a little further down Fleet Street. I was mentioning a few seconds ago about, um, about newspapers, and there's a building here with the letters on the side advertising its former occupants. The Dundee Courier, the People's Journal, People's Friend, and the, uh, the Dundee Evening Telegraph. So if you know where to look on the sides of buildings, the history of this area is still talking to us, which is rather interesting. Yeah, just on the right-hand side here is the Tipperary pub. It's actually said to be London's oldest pub. Uh, it dates from 1667, however there's evidence that there was a pub on the site since 1605. It's had a few names, different names over the years. It was the Boar's Head at one point, and was also called um, the Bolton Tun. But in 1895, it changed its name to Mooney's. It was the first Irish pub in, uh, in London. And in 1918, it changed its name to the Tipperary after that popular World War I song. It's a long way to Tipperary. And it's here on the Fleet Street, the Tipperary pub, London's oldest. But opposite that, opposite the pub is Bolt Court, and there's a sign on the on the plaque on the uh, on the floor which commemorates the launch of the Sun newspaper on Tuesday, the 15th of September, 1964. It was launched to replace a, uh, an existing newspaper called the Herald, and it was printed in uh, Bouvier Street, just across the road from uh, from the from Bolt Court. It's another little reminder to. Uh, to Fleet Street's past and journalism. Let's wander through here to uh, Bolt Court and, uh, and see what we can discover. We'll try and find Dr. Johnson's house, which I think is down here somewhere. It's rather pleasant here, walking through, uh, seeing these old street lights. They preserve these old court uh, quite nicely. Reminds me of walking through his back streets in Bristol the other week and also 
in Braintree looking at all the Gants, all the um, all the uh, little back street passages. But this leads into uh, St Dunstan's Court. Another, another little courtyard here, go around the corner. And uh, yeah, it's one of the modern buildings that sort of uh, they give this area away a little bit, but I can imagine a few hundred years ago, let's say back in the early 17th century, when the Tipperary pub, or the Boar's Head as it was back then, was uh, popular with, uh, with patrons. Is these alleyways would have had a different feel. Oh, and I'm back onto Fleet Street. Well, the sign did say Dr. Johnson's house was down here somewhere, so I probably walked past it. Let's walk back down through, uh, through Dunstan's Court and uh, see if we can find Dr. Johnson's house. Must be around here somewhere. Yeah, here we go. I walked past it. Silly me. <laughs> I walked past it. Through down through this little narrow alleyway into another court. Yeah, there's a sign saying Dr. Johnson's house. It's up here, up past uh, Boswell House. Another little, another little courtyard. This is really rather nice around here. And just as I walk into the courtyard here, there's a statue of a cat. There we go. This is Dr. Johnson's cat. It was called Hodge, and this sculptor was installed back in 1997. The sculptor was uh, John Bickley. The cat is sitting next to an empty oyster shell because apparently Dr. Johnson liked to feed him oysters. Nothing like having a spoilt cat in the family, is there? There we go. Oh, he's, I spoiled my cat. He likes his treats, his dreamies, and so I guess Dr. Johnson was right to uh, to sponsor to uh, not sponsor to spoil and treat his cat with oysters. Here's Dr. Johnson's house. He was born in 1709 and died in 1784. Famous author uh, of the dictionary. There we go. Dr. Johnson's house. This area must have changed quite a lot since, uh, since Dr. Johnson lived here. There's these modern buildings going up. But it's nice they preserve the cobbles here and the uh, the spirit of the uh, of the old uh, of the old back street thoroughfares here it's really rather interesting but there's an archway here so let's walk through the archway and see where this goes just walking into gunpowder court i don't know why it's called gunpowder court but it's nice that they, they uh, retain the old name as well. They've even got a replica cannon mounted here in the court. It's got a wonky wheel. I wonder why it's got a wonky wheel. But this is, uh, this for a little thoroughfare is wine office court. I guess there were lots of vintners around here at one point. It's interesting looking at the architecture. You've got the old on one side and the more modern buildings on the other. Dean Wace House, number seven there. I wonder who Dean Wace was. Maybe connected to one of the local churches perhaps. You've got the Church of St Dunstan's in the west, uh, just a few doors down on the opposite side of the road to the Tipperary. There's another old pub down here, Ye Old Cheshire Cheese. It was built in 1667. I do like these old pubs. They have so much character to their outside decor. This one's really interesting because there's a little plaque on the side which indicates all the monarchs that have been on the throne of England since the, uh, since the pub was refounded. All the way back in the uh, days of Charles II. We're back now onto Fleet Street. At the bottom of Fleet Street is a crossroads. 
and then Ludgate Hill which goes up towards uh, St Paul's Cathedral and uh, so I'm going to take a walk up there see what we can discover on the way to my half past two appointment which I shall tell you about very shortly just walking up uh, Ludgate Hill it's interesting actually talking about newspapers in Fleet Street the first printed newspaper in London was printed here on Ludgate Hill in uh, 1702 it was called the Daily Current they obviously moved to uh, to Fleet Street but there's another old um, another old street name here it's just crossing over Pageant Master Court the building on the corner from 1891 but Ludgate Hill has been used in so many films and television especially with the backdrop of St Paul's Cathedral at the far end and of course royal events and uh, they all process up Ludgate Hill because the really impressive site that's right ahead of imagine what it must have been like a few hundred years ago after the uh, cathedral was built before these modern buildings were erected around it. it must have been so impressive indeed but with churches there's uh, St Martin's within Ludgate on the left hand side the size of an old medieval church there were no end of medieval churches in London but that one was rebuilt between 1677 and 1684 by Sir Christopher Wren. So many of his churches have survived. Which is, which is really nice given the, this area of London took a right pasting during the Second World War. I'm surprised that St Paul's Cathedral is actually still standing given the amount of bombing that took place here during the Second World War it started on the evening of, 11, of the 7th of September 1940 and continued until the 11th of May 1941 and at one point 57 consecutive nights the Luftwaffe dropped bombs around St Paul's Cathedral and there's that famous photograph of St Paul's covered in smoke and fire. A few incendiaries did actually hit the cathedral. There were brave firefighters up on the, or fire watchers, up on the uh, cathedral roof with buckets of sand to put out the fire. And there are still marks on the top of the, uh, the dome and every, and around the walkways at the top evidence of the uh, of the bombing but just up ahead is the, uh, the National Firefighters Monument which actually commemorates all those brave firefighters who during the Second World War saved the Cathedral from destruction I think it's Winston Churchill who said uh, save the Cathedral no matter what the cost so Christopher Wren's masterpiece could quite easily have been lost in the same way as Coventry Cathedral was lost and Dresden Cathedral, just to name two. So, so many important buildings, historic buildings were destroyed during the Second World War, not just in London or England, but on the continent as well. And for as many as the Luftwaffe destroyed here in England, unfortunately the Allies destroyed many in Germany which is uh, such a consequence of war. But here we go, here's the National Firefighters Monument. It's quite spectacular. Names of all the people around the, uh, around the sides. Uh, it was installed, well the sculptor was uh, John W. Mills. Different to the uh, John Mills, the actor, but John W. Mills. It was unveiled on the 4th of May, 1991. 
by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. That's the, uh, the mother of our current, current monarch, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. And it really is quite a, quite, a, quite a fantastic structure to look at it. You can see the firefighters on the top standing on the rubble with the hoses trained putting out the fire. First class monument, very befitting for um, such brave people who, uh, who saved London from even more destruction than it could have been. But let's walk forward, further forward and uh, towards, uh, towards London Bridge. I'm not going to give away what my appointment is at half past two, but heading in the direction of London Bridge. But you've probably seen the title of this video and read the description, so you've probably got an inkling of where my appointment is. But I will reveal all very shortly. way down to Cannon Street and this is uh, College Hill just off Cannon Street. And at the bottom is quite an interesting old church. It's the church of um, St Michael's Paternoster um, but it's not the church that I've come to look at. There's a couple of wall plaques down here. It's a rather famous man who also had a cat. Dr Johnson was uh, renowned for his cat called Hodge. But so was a man called Dick Whittington, or so we believe, who was three times Lord Mayor of London in the late medieval period. He's also said to have had a cat. And he, he lived down here. I just walked past, I've just walked past his plaque. Too busy talking, that's what it is. Let's walk back up here. Yeah, the plaque, the house of Richard Whittington, Mayor of London, stood on this site. 1423. There we go. Dick Whittington lived here. He's also buried here as well, just next door. The, the church, the former church of St. St. Michael Paternoster. And there we go, there's another plaque on the wall. Richard Whittington says here four times Mayor of London. Founded and was buried in this church 1422. Mm, according to Wikipedia, he died in March 1423 and was three times Mayor of London. I wonder who's right. I'm right, he had a cat. That's the important factor, he had a cat. I do like cats. I've got one of my own. <laughs> and uh, I suppose like all cats, no, Dr Johnson spoiled his cat by giving him oysters. I spoil my cat by giving him dreamies. Other snacks are available for cats. Um, and I wonder if Dick Whittington did the same for his cat. Or is it just fable that he had a cat? Basis of the pantomime. You get quite a nice view standing here of uh, the church of St Michael's Paternoster. Be rather pleasant. It's not a working church anymore. It's. Uh, there's a plaque on the wall which says who it is. The International Headquarters, St Michael, Paternoster Royal, College Hill, London, uh, the Mission to Seafarers, patron Her Majesty the Queen. I wonder if uh, no, perhaps it is a working church. Certainly no board on the side to indicate services or a vicar. But again, this is one of the nice medieval back streets of London. Kept the old cobbles and in medieval time the, uh, the buildings would have been a little bit closer to the road. In very narrow streets indeed. But it's rather pleasant. Just walking around here. Oh dear. Oh there's another plaque on the wall as well. The site of the Duke of Buckingham's house in 1672. There we go. Another plaque on the wall. Duke of Buckingham's house. There's quite a few little plaques around here. It's quite interesting. 
Now let's head back up onto Cannon Street and see what we can discover in Cannon Street on the way to my appointment, which you've probably worked out, is the Sky Gardens. Yes, I got tickets for the Sky Gardens. I tried to get tickets, a ticket, and I needed one, it's only one of me, uh, back in, uh, back at the end of June when I was last in London. And I couldn't get them at all. But I managed to get a ticket for the Sky Garden. I do like walking around gardens. And to visit a garden that's, I think, 14 floors high is uh, rather interesting. But I've got a little way yet to my appointment. I'm down here a little bit earlier than I anticipated. So uh, I'm going to explore Cannon Street and see what we can find down here on the way to the Sky Garden. I've done so much walking today, I needed to sit down. Got a cup of tea as well. All I've done the last few days is walk and sit down and drink cups of tea. Can't beat a cup of tea. But I found these most delightful little gardens. It's the former gardens of St Swithin's Church who used to stand on the site just behind me. It got bombed during the Second World War, like so many churches in central London. And this one, well, it was never rebuilt. They've turned what was probably the site of the church or the churchyard into a delightful little gardens. And a great place to come and, and drink tea and have lunch. And St Swithin's, St Swithin's Lane is just, just to my right. But of course, if it rains on St Swithin's Day, it's said to rain for 40 days and 40 nights. St Swithin's Day is on the 15th of July. So we don't want rain on the 15th of July. Otherwise we have rain all through the summer. I think it did rain on St Swithin's Day this year actually. It was probably why you've had such a bad summer. Oh. But it's quite a nice little garden. It's got nice little seating. And the other thing is you're surrounded by high rise buildings, which is which is not very good, but it does get a bit of sun there. There's a little bit of sun coming through, which is nice. But on Cannon Street, somewhere on Cannon Street, is the old London Stone. Now I know it's on, on the outside of one of the buildings, so I'm gonna try and find that just as soon as I've drunk my cup of tea. Oh, lovely. And, uh, and take a look at that, uh, the London Stone. It's got quite a history, apparently. So I'm hoping there'll be a plaque on the outside which will tell me a little more about it. It's just uh, just along from St Swithin's Lane, so I'll take a look at that and then head up to the Sky Garden where I'm going to end this video and walk around the gardens up there and see what they have. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I've seen pictures online, especially of the views, so yeah, looking forward to that. I waited a long while for this visit, <laughs> booked it ages ago, so uh, but first, I'm going to finish my tea. Oh. I really enjoyed visiting those gardens. What a nice quiet place to enjoy a spot of lunch. I do enjoy walking down back streets and back alleys because you never know what you're going to find when you get down there. Really rather pleasant. But I'm going to head back onto Cannon Street and just round the corner is the old London Stone. Nobody knows the stone's origin. It's believed to be Roman, but it could even be older than that. Perhaps it had some sort of, some sort of significance by whereby important people sat on the stone or were pronounced king or something on the stone. Something similar to the Stone of Schoon in Scotland. It's been sitting here since uh, 1742. He used to live in an alcove on the side of St Swithin's Church, and that was got bombed. And it's been in the British Museum, I think, or the Museum of London. Has now been set here uh, in 2018 for all to see. But it's been called the London Stone since the 12th century. 
1450, a man called uh, Jack Cade led a rebellion against he Henry VI's corrupt government. And he struck it with his sword and proclaimed himself Lord of London. There we go, the London Stone. One of the famous pieces of masonry here in London. Probably older than London itself. If its origins um, go back to go back to um, perhaps pre-Roman, I imagine it's probably Roman in some has some significance. And perhaps it stood in the Forum, a principal stone in the Forum, in Roman Londinium. But I guess we'll never know its true origin of the uh, of the of the stone. But it's nice to see it on display for all to see. But now let's head to the Sky Garden and explore that. I'm so looking forward to this. Well, I've made it to Fenchurch Street. And the building I'm looking for is number 20. It's just ahead of me. It's called the Walkie Talkie. Well, it's been given the nickname the Walkie Talkie because of its design. There are quite a, few, quite a few buildings in London that have got nicknames. Got the battery, the gherkin, and the electric razor, just to name a few. But looking up at it, it really is rather impressive indeed. But round the side is the entrance to the Sky Garden. So let's go and uh, join the queue. I'm a little early, so I don't know if I can get in or not, but we'll soon find out. If not, I'll get told to come back at my appointed time. But maybe I can get a little bit earlier. I don't think it's that busy. Well, I hope not. <laughs> it was a few months ago that I tried to book, so uh, hopefully it's uh, hopefully it's uh, a, little, a little less busy today. Just go down this little walkway. I hope I'm going in the right way, right direction. Well, we'll soon find out. <laughs> I can't be lost walking around a building, surely. There we go. Oh, it looks like there's some entrance doors up ahead here. So let's go and have a look at the Sky Garden. the sky garden and this place is buzzing with people it's brilliant and the views are just fantastic up here absolutely amazing and probably the best view in London just move up, up here a little bit behind me you can see Tower Bridge and the Tower of London it's the first time I've seen Tower, the Tower of London from above. Normally you just see it on a, on a photograph. But you can see what an incredible building. It is, my goodness me. Wow, this place is so exciting. Just walk further up these steps. A bit further up, you've got a great view overlooking uh, Canary Wharf. Absolutely brilliant. Something about going up tall buildings and taking a look at the, uh, the views from the top. You think you need to come here for yourself and have a look. It is free entry, but you do have to book. And I booked about three months ago. Yeah, I've waited a long time and uh, <laughs> I tried to, so as I said, I tried to book when I was here in London three months ago and I just couldn't get in. Now I know why, it's so popular. It's so popular up here. All the restaurants are buzzing, people are eating and drinking, people are walking around taking selfies. There's even a strange lady walking around talking to a camera. Oh, whoops, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> Let's walk further up the steps and see what else we can discover here at the Sky Garden.
the other side. They've got a great view here, looking across at St Paul's Cathedral. And behind that, the law courts, where I was earlier. But looking down on London, really, you get to appreciate the size of London, the variety of the architecture, old and new. And looking down, there are quite a few buildings which have little gardens, rooftop gardens as well. And you can also see the old churches of London, all those designed by Sir Christopher Wren and those that survived the Great Fire of London, all sandwiched in between the modern buildings. Now, if I've been up this height, standing here, let's say 500 years ago, I would have seen a very different London. Looking across at medieval streets, medieval buildings, no more than two storeys, possibly three storeys tall. And the outlook across here would have been open fields because London was very small 500 years ago. And all around at Tyburn and out towards Golders Green and Paddington and all that area of London was all green fields. Uh, it's very hard actually standing up here looking out the window to actually see the old architecture because there is just so much, so many more modern buildings. You can make out the churches and of course St Paul's is dominating the view out of this window. St Paul's must have been quite incredible to see when it was first built. Back in, uh, was it, 1690s, I think it was completed. It really is a marvel of uh, British architecture. Sky Garden and the view outside the window looking across at the River Thames and HMS Belfast really is quite something. It's a view I've never seen before. It's also a nice view looking down on all the diners. Well apparently as I suffer from vertigo I'll look at the photograph that I've just taken rather than look down. <laughs> but. This is where I end this video. I'm going to leave you with a selection of photographs which I've taken out of the window with views across London. And we'll see you next time for another adventure somewhere else. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and follow my journey. And we'll see you soon. <laughs>